Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Scarecrow of Oz by L. Frank Baum. So this is one of the Oz books. I read this as a buddy read with Joel Swagman. We're slowly going through the whole series. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and read the blurb. Then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads. And now, if you'll kindly excuse me for a time, I'll go over to the castle and do my conquering. Dragged down through a whirlpool into the fairyland of Mo, Trot and Cap'n Bill must find their way to the safety of Oz. But as they pass through the dominion of the mean King Cruel, it takes the brains of the Scarecrow to find a way to return the throne to its rightful owner and save the people from the Wicked Witch's evil magic. But will Trot and Cap'n Bill ever make it to Oz? Well, let's find out. Okay, so they meet an orc, spelled O-R-K. It's a type of bird. But uh, someone commented on one of my reviews recently to ask how, uh, to ask whether I thought that Tolkien was influenced by L. Frank Baum. And I guess that kind of suggests that he was, doesn't it? Uh, and they meet this guy called Pessim, the Observer. Um, and his name is a bit of a, a joke because he's very pessimistic. So they talk about the, uh, his island and he goes, The trees are altogether too green and the rocks are harder than they ought to be. I find the sand very grainy and the water dreadfully wet. Every breeze makes a draft and the sun shines in the daytime when there's no need of it and disappears just as soon as it begins to get dark. If you remain here, you'll find the island very unsatisfactory. And we get this little conversation between um, Pessim and uh, the Orc. <laughs> so he goes, well, well, what do you think of me now? He asks proudly. You are very skinny and remarkably ugly, declared Pessim. You are a poor judge of orcs, was the reply. Anyone can see that I'm much handsomer than those dreadful things called birds, which are all fluff and feathers. Also, I wasn't sure if it should be handsomer or more handsome. Their feathers make soft beds, asserted Pessim. And my skin would make excellent drumheads, retorted the orc. Nevertheless, a plucked bird or a skinned orc would be of no value to himself, so we needn't brag of our usefulness after we are dead. But for the sake of argument, friend Pessim, I'd like to know what good you would be were you not alive. And then Cap'n Bill says, never mind that, he isn't much good as he is. And then there's one of the kind of philosophical lines where Trot says, uh, nobody can stay alive without getting into danger sometimes. And danger doesn't mean getting hurt, Cap'n. It only means we might get hurt. So I guess we'll have to take the risk. And later on they meet a mountain ear. Um, not a mountain ear, a mountain ear. Again, just one of uh, L. Frank Baum's fun little plays on words. Play on words. Not sure what the plural is there. Oh, and Button Bright shows up, uh, so he was in some of the previous books. I can't remember which ones. Joel is a lot better than I am at remembering when characters like first showed up and in which previous books they were in and stuff. I can never remember. And so the antagonist, or at least like one of the bad guys in this, is King Cruel, uh, who has a castle and he's a bad guy. You can tell from his name because he's called King Cruel. Um, but uh, Captain Bill says. Um, because Trot asks whether he, they, he, whether he thinks they should keep away from the King's castle and, and Cap'n Bill says, well, King Cruel would find out sooner or later that we are in his country, so we may as well face the music now. Perhaps he isn't quite so bad as that woman thinks he is. Kings aren't always popular with their people, you know, even if they do the best they know how. Ozma is popular, said Button Bright. Ozma is different from any other ruler from all I've heard, remarked Trot musingly as she walked beside the boy. Hate musingly. No, don't use that word. And after all, we are really in the land of Oz, where Ozma rules every king and everybody else. I never heard of anybody getting hurt in her dominions, did you, Button Bright? I mean, people are always getting hurt. What are you on about? And so here we get a reference to nobody dying in, in Oz, which has kind of not been consistent throughout. Sometimes people do, sometimes people don't. Um, but yeah, little little kid called Pon, um, who there's basically, he kind of becomes, I don't know, he has a love interest. Uh, with the, he likes the princess, and he's the rightful prince, but the princess has this spell cast on her so that her heart freezes. But anyway, Pon goes, My father used to be the king, and Cruel was his prime minister. But one day while out hunting, King Fierce, that was my father's name, had a quarrel with Cruel and tapped him gently on the nose with the knuckles of his closed hand. This so provoked the wicked Cruel that he tripped my father backwards, so that he fell into a deep pond. At once Cruel threw in a mass of heavy stones, which so weighted down my poor father that his body could not rise again to the surface. It is impossible to kill anyone in this land, as perhaps you know, but when my father was pressed down into the mud at the bottom of the deep pool and the stones held him so he could never escape, he was of no more use to himself or the world than if he had died. Knowing this, Cruel proclaimed himself king, taking possession of the royal castle and driving all my father's people out. I was a small boy then, but when I grew up I became a gardener. I have served King Cruel without his knowing that I am the son of the same King Fierce whom he so cruelly made away with. And like, 
That's just that just sucks to be the, that king who's like buried under the water and just can't move. Kind of a fate worse than death. Like this is one of the side effects of him trying to almost make this sanitized land where you know kids don't have to worry about death. And then he gives these people this fate worse than death. Like the guy who got pulled and pecked apart by the invisible bears or whatever. It's like, but if he didn't die. He's just still alive, but he's been torn to pieces. That's awful. And uh, so the king, King Cruel, asks uh, the, the wicked witch, uh, the wicked witch in their land called Blinky, whether he can freeze this, you know, freeze his daughter's heart or whatever so she doesn't fall in love. And the wicked witch goes, that's a hard question to answer. I can do lots of clever magic, but love is a stubborn thing to conquer. When you think you've killed it, it's liable to bob up again as strong as ever. I believe love and cats have nine lives. And Glinda the Good Witch is talking to the Scarecrow and she goes, As you have no need to sleep, you may as well start at once. The night is the same as day to me, he replied, except that I cannot see my way so well in the dark. And I just, I relate to that as a serial insomniac. But yeah, so that's not until like two thirds of the way in that the Scarecrow even comes into the story. And he's kind of sent along to collect <laughs> the the main characters I guess. Uh, we get the phrase thickly settled showed up twice as well and I just happened to notice it because it's an odd phrase but also it was an important phrase in a short story that a friend of mine called Alex Kimmel wrote for an anthology that I wrote um, and I read it reread it not long ago because Alex unfortunately passed away not too long ago so it's just weird to see the phrase thickly settled twice and we have a a brief description of the Emerald City of Oz that I'm not going to read, but it says, uh, also says, Born of a long line of fairy queens, Ozma is nearly as perfect as any fairy may be, and she is noted for her wisdom as well as for her other qualities. But the, I mean, Joel said in his reviews, the kind of in-joke, and we're not, it's not clear whether Frank L. Baum intended it, but she's not wise at all. She keeps making terrible decisions. And so, yeah, that's all I really have to talk about from the Scarecrow of Oz. I mean, my main feeling is, like, I thought it was a decent enough story, but it almost didn't need to be an Oz book. Like, the o the Scarecrow comes in two-thirds of the way through and isn't really needed. There would have been better ways of using, you know, moving the story along without the Scarecrow. And then Dorothy and Ozma and those, like, they all make an appearance at the end as kind of a bit of a cameo. But actually, I think this would have worked better if it wasn't an Oz story. Like, they could have used the same ideas and just told a non-Oz story, but then I guess I wouldn't have read it, so there is that. Overall, I gave it like a middle of the road 3.5 out of 5. It was okay. Um, not a particularly special example of the Oz books, but you know, it is what it is. By the way, sorry if you can hear my washing machine going mental. I can't get downstairs to pause it because I've been painting the steps. I thought it wasn't worth mentioning, and now I'm mentioning it for whatever reason. So yeah, there we have it. That's what I made of The Scarecrow of Oz. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.